Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's program. And on today's show, joining me from England is the author of this book, Gone to Pot, Cannabis, What Every Parent Needs to Know. Uh, Please welcome to the show, Terry Hammond. Hey, Terry, and welcome to the program. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate this, and I really... uh, I, I mean, I have I have the book right here, so I did read yes. it. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, it was a very, very um, informative book uh, and um, very I don't know, intense at, you know, yeah. when you were describing your uh, family situation. Um, and there's probably a lot of people out there that may be going through the same thing and they may not even be aware of cannabis uh, induced psychosis, right? It's, it's not like yeah, an everyday thing. Right. And until a recent thing happened in my circle, I had no idea what it was. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to talk about this very important and personal issue and, uh, these consequences, very serious consequences it has on young people developing yeah. cannabis or marijuana induced psychosis. Yeah. But, um, Terry, before we go ahead and start, um, into the bulk of the interview, uh, can you give the audience a little bit of background on your, you know, both personal and professional? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, my background, um, I kind of started fairly humbly. I left school at 15, um, lived in a fairly poor part of London uh, during the 50s. So it was a, an area that had been pretty well bombed during the, during the, uh, during the war. So um, so I left school at 15 because I needed to earn some money. Uh, my mum was a, a one parent family and she had two other th- uh, three kids to bring up. Um, so it started off fairly humbly, but I soon got a passion when I was started in my 20s. I began to realize I, I, I had a passion for working with people and and injustice. Uh, and I got a job working in the homeless field um, in my 20s and worked, just sort of worked my way up. Um, and eventually I got a job uh, working uh, for a homeless charity, working for people with mental health issues. And I really got the bug then. I, and it always it seemed to me then uh, in, in that early days of my career that the twi- that uh, people with mental health people, there's a great injustice because it was a condition oh. that many, most people can uh, can uh, um, recover from. Um, but but you need a lot of support. But anyway, so I carried on that thing and I eventually worked up the uh, the greasy pole and I went and got myself a few qualifications. Uh, and I eventually I then became um, I worked for a, a, a large. Well, I eventually ended up working for one of the largest mental health charities um, called Rethink in Europe. Uh, and I was a regional regional director there. And my job basically was uh, development, innovation and working with hospitals in rehabilitation. So I, I primarily, my background, my profession was very much about, I specialized in developing schemes to help people um, integrate back into the community, uh, housing schemes, day centers, um, um, advocacy projects, um, one-to-one peer projects, all that kind of thing. And I did that for, for, for 20 years. Um, and, uh, I won a couple of awards, which I was really proud to uh, to have received. Um, so, my, so in a nutshell, then my background. I'm now retired. I took early retirement, uh, primarily really to to write. Um, I, I, I've written plays. That's what I, that's what I've actually focused on in the last uh, few years of my retirement. But um, but I've always had this passion with regards to mental health and particularly my uh, my own personal experience with my son. Uh, no doubt if you want to talk about that later, but um, yeah, the experience of my son and I, that's what drove me to write the book. In my right. 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 And so it, cannabis or marijuana induced psychosis uh, hit your family a number of years, it was a number of years ago, quite a bit, right? 30? That's right. Or, yeah, uh, something like that, and uh, obviously, 20, prompting, 20 years prompt, ago. I'm sorry, 20 odd years ago, it was okay, a, 20, yeah, and uh, this, of course, prompted the writing of the book, uh, Gone to Pot. Um, Terry, are, are you willing to share your story with the 
viewing and the listening audience. Very much so, yeah, very much okay. so. You got the floor, sir. Okay, um, <laughs> and you can tell me when I when you've had enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story, but now anyway, I'll, I'll try and be as succinct as I can. I mean, basically, it all started when my son uh, Steve was um, he was nineteen twenty, uh, and he was you know at the pinnacle, ready to flourish, ready to to, to rule the world as they do at a nineteen year old. And one day I was sitting in front of the television and I heard uh, and he suddenly looked up at me and said, why did you ring the BBC up, the, um, the television up? And I said, I'm sorry, Steve, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you know, he said, because the television has been talking to me all day and the radio has been broadcasting my name. And I just felt sick and and the, it was as if the whole world had dropped out because I then realised I had a very sick boy. And unbeknown to me, because um, I I didn't know much about cannabis. Uh, uh, this was back in the eight, 90s. Um, it was late, late 90s, actually. It was 2000 that he developed it. But during my career, I'd, I'd come across it, cannabis, but it was it was something that was really very much from the sort of my working class background. It was really only students and people like that and posh kids took cannabis. So I never really, it never came across my path as a, as a young person, as a young man. And so I was really knocked back when I, when Steve, had, uh, I, I discovered later that he'd been binging on cannabis. And from there on, um, we went into a period, what I call the black hole, um, even though I'd, I'd worked in mental health and I'd worked with a lot of people with, with schizophrenia and I'd also worked with people who had told me they'd taken cannabis. I was just completely uh, not for six. I didn't know, I really didn't know what to do and how to deal with it. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a, 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 it was though I'd been dropped in the middle of a Brazilian jungle and I didn't know, I didn't have a compass. I didn't know how to get out of this. And uh, Steve really became very ill, became very psychotic. Um, and he then eventually, after a period of time, we got him into hospital. Um, and we thought, great, he went into hospital. And they said he was di they diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. And then we then learned, because he told the psychiatrist that he'd been taking cannabis. Um, and I then, you know, uh, he, he then... Well, he was in the hospital for about three months, and then he then um, he was he was discharged, and we thought then great, you know, he's he's been discharged, he's back, um, we've we've got him back, and uh, and we thought well, that's it, we're on the road to recovery. But little did I realise it was the it, it was life had only just begun for us with regards living with somebody with schizophrenia, and uh, and and although they had. Um, it, they had dealt with his psychosis in as far as with m medication. They'd subdued his psychosis. It, it hadn't gone. Um, Steve was just a very, very frightened young man. And there we are, a guy who had the potential of being a really good footballer, girlfriends, uh, at, you know, at the pinnacle of his life. Suddenly he, he was living in this world of madness and he was just very, very frightened. And I just, my wife and I, we just felt so, so sad for him. And, uh, and it, it was, it was, my wife said it was like a form of bereavement. She'd let, lost the boy that she knew. And that period of time, that black hole period went on for about five years. And uh, we had some pretty hairy moments with, with Steve. He would do very bizarre things. He would, <laughs> one day he, I, my, a neighbour came round to my house and said, oh, I'm sorry, Steve. He said, I know you've got a, a lot on your plate at the moment, but um, your son has, uh, has, has thrown eggs at my window. So when I looked, every single window in his house was covered with eggs. And, and I said to Steve, well, why on earth did you do that? He said, because they were peering at me and I had to stop them looking at me. And uh, so that was just a small, small instance. But we had things of him. He'd be wandering. He'd be wandering uh, 
th through the high street where we lived, or we lived in a sort of just outside Southampton, south of south of England. And he would be um, mumbling and talking to himself. And and he told me one day that a, a white a, a van pulled up and shouted out, you know, get off the streets, you nutter, you know, uh, which didn't do a lot for, for his, his self-esteem. And then th that period went on and uh, again, as I say, for about five years. And then we started to get uh, small breaks in as far as one of the psychiatrists he had, we, and that's one of the keys, was we had a fantastic psychiatrist and he suggested that we got, um, that, we, that he had some cognitive therapy because he he believed it was aliens that, had, that were in his head. Because he said to me, uh, I said to him, well, you know, where do you think your voices come from? And he said, well, they're aliens. He said, where else do you think they come from, Dad? Dad there's, there's nowhere else they could come from. And and he he believed that um, that other people were affected. And he used one day he came up to me and touched my face and said, "Are you my dad or are you an alien?" Um, and he he did that one 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 night and he didn't believe me that I that I was. And he threw me out. He just pushed me because he was a big lad. He's not bigger than I am. He's six foot. He pushed me out the room and then started smashing his room up. And I was just so frightened. And my wife said, you're going to go in there and sort it out. And I said, and I was truly frightened, truly, truly frightened. And I eventually I did go in there, um, but he'd calmed down and then he rationalised things. But then he had um, some cognitive therapy, talking therapy, and they he had a series of that. And that was remarkable because it gave him insight. And just to give you a little short story, which which uh, is, it, 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 it's very poignant. The psychiatrist said to him, because the psych psychiatrist in, included us, whenever whenever we had, he spoke to Steve, he said to Steve, would you mind if your dad got involved? And that was so crucial. Sometimes Steve said no, but quite often he said yes. And on this particular occasion, he said to, um, the, uh, the psychiatrist said to Steve, so have you got voices still? And he said, yeah, of course I have. He said, where do you think they come from then, Steve? Aliens. And then he asked the crucial question. How certain are you that, Steve? And Steve pondered for a moment and said, 90% uh, certain. Right, OK. And then he asked the genius question. So what's the 10% then, Steve? And Steve, I always remember this. He looked at the psychiatrist and said, well, it's a bit mad, really, isn't it? But he said, no, I still think it's aliens. Then he had this series of um, cognitive therapy. I won't go into it because we had some fun because he initially refused to go there. But then the psychiatrist had a great, great idea of getting a, 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 a therapist who was, who was uh, uh, young and good looking. And so that made him go, <laughs> that made him attend the sessions. And he had about nine, nine or ten sessions. And then he came back and then he, the psychiatrist asked him the same question again. Um, and we were there and he said, Steve, he said, he said, uh, you still got your your voices? Oh, yeah, 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 of course I have. Where do you think they come from? I always remember this. He said, well, he said, I, um, they're from my head. So I went, well, yes, great. And then he said to him, the psychiatrist said, well, how certain are you that, Steve? He said, 88% certain, 88%. So the psychiatrist said to him, well, What's the what's the twelve percent then, Steve? He said, "Well, it's all the things my voices say. I, I don't think I could be that clever." And I thought that and that made me realise the kind of his self esteem, because obviously, you know, his his voices are uh, clever. He can be clever at times. But after that time, he started to improve. Um, he then went to he started going to a day centre, um, and we had a young lad about. 25 year old well I when he came knocked on the door of the social work I think he looked like, like about 11 year old <laughs> as you do when you get older didn't you and this social worker and he had, he had a a baseball cap turned around the other way uh, and he had a skateboard and I thought my goodness who, who's this coming to the door and he said oh I'm Steve's new support worker so I thought you know, prejudiced, older man looking at a younger bloke, total prejudice, thinking, oh, my God, what have we got here? 
But this lad was a genius. He was another, well, not a genius, he was brilliant. Because he said, Steve, we're going out. Because he knew that Steve was good on the skateboard when he was younger. Took the, took Steve out. And that was the lad who got this 25-year-old social worker got Steve out. And so really it, things over the last, it, we progressed. Um, he eventually got into um, a, a, a horticultural project. Um, and um, he's still got his voices. He still gets them now, but he knows where they come from. He knows they're in his head. But he said to me, Dad, I just wish they weren't there. And, um, and you know, it's just, it's still, he's still a, he's still a, a use the word disabled lad. Okay. That's a lot, Terry. That's a lot. Sorry. No, 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 not the time, the, the story itself and uh and and you probably just gave us a very small snippet yeah yeah um, just, of everything you've gone good. through and uh but let, let me ask you about the 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 i guess you call it cannabis in in england we call it marijuana here yeah i'll try uh, and remember marijuana yeah but it's no it's it's okay um but as far as the cannabis use you were unaware of it and and do you know if his use was very heavy he was binging on it. Um, he, yeah. he, I think what he was doing, he was telling me he was going out on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And he said he was ended up smoke, uh, using cannabis like cigarettes. So he, he would have maybe maybe 10 joints uh, in an evening. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we now know, which you know, I can talk about that later. We now know that, um, and he was doing it every weekend. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but it, it, he said he started smoking when he went to college when he was 18. But only like, you know, as they do, experimenting with it. And he liked it. Obviously, it gave him a bit of euphoria, made him feel good, because that's why people take it. Mm -hmm. And um, he, yeah, and then he started smoking on a regular basis. So that was the, that was, that was probably the un, undoing of Steve. He, he took it on a regular basis. And, and he was smoking skunk, which was the heavier, so the stronger and higher levels of uh, the THC. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, that was actually my next question about the active ingredient in marijuana or cannabis uh, THC, which is key um, to this um, yeah. mental health issue. Um, Terry, it's not in, present in the same levels as it was when I was a kid in the 70s, right? I mean, it's much yeah. different than today. And, and, and I just want to point out to the audience uh, Terry's book details this information very, very well. It's very well researched. Yeah. But, uh, go ahead, Terry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you if you went to Afghanistan and you and you picked it up there and, and, and grew it in its natural state, then it would be the same um, uh, than, than, than you were in, when in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but what's uh, – and, and the normal content of THC, the tetrahydrocabinoid – uh, you know, which is the, that's the substance that gives you the, the euphoria um, is usually about 3% uh, in a natural, in its natural state, but it's been genetically modified. That's the problem uh, really by gangsters, by criminals. Mm -hmm. They've, they've genetically modified it. Um, and so it's, it, it varies of course, from country to country from, but in the UK um, research has been done in, and it's about 16%. So it's roughly three times stronger than it was. However, what you can do, uh, 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 and when I was researching this book, I, I, I was speaking to a scientist, uh, Professor Robin Murray, fantastic man. And he said that you can go to, uh, to Holland and parts of London where they genetically modified it. So you get 50% THC and even 60% THC. And that, really you know can really blow your mind taking that and this professor murray said to me that a young because the issue really and again we can come on to this later on the issue really about cannabis is taking it when you're a teenager when your brain your brain is growing and that's that's and if you if you're taking it on a regular basis and if you take high levels of, of cannabis or marijuana with 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 high levels of thc then that's the issue. That's that's the thing uh, that, that can cause you the problem. Um, and so, well, anyway, so that that that's the that that that's it. So I think th the issue now is that um, well, as Professor Murray said to me, that a young eighteen-year-old could go to 
Amsterdam. He could go on a Friday night. He could smoke a few of these 50% THCs. And the risk of him developing mental health goes up exponentially. Mm. And he could come back on a Monday with his mates uh, with the starting of mental health. It, it's as bad as that. Uh, it can what it does it can it damages the neurotransmitters in the brain this powerful stuff it's a toxin mm -hmm. and you're putting stuff in your in your brain that's not meant to be there <laughs> you've got we, we've got thc we've got we've got tetra we, we've got the um uh, uh the, the the dopamine i i won't go into too much detail but there's do the, the one the neurotransmitter um we've got a natural ability to have euphoria because that's what makes us laugh. That's what's have us fun. And we've got that natural ability in our brains. And what if you mass produce this artificially, then you're interfering with the way the brain works and, and can cause long term damage. So so, that, yeah. so so Terry, is this is this problem primarily in, in younger people? Or I mean, could it could have happened to somebody like me. <laughs> it could do yeah. yeah the risk the risk is lower the risk yeah. is lower um the risk the, the what the science now is clear you know and i re really researched it because i really wanted to get a balanced view on this because i didn't want to demonize cannabis i didn't want to demonize the users but um the risk now most scientists agree that it's uh if you, the younger you are the earlier you start and the level of thc increases the risk mm -hmm. um and um in the in the uk now they've did some of the latest research is showing that uh, increasing numbers of young people are developing psychosis as a lack of it if you and i took it the risk would be lower but if you and i took the high levels of stuff but but then it all comes down to um predisposition and your genetic background sure you know, so there's, and, and, and also, you know, whether you live in poverty, whether, you know, lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. So it's a complex issue. And that's why you can never say it it's definitely causes it. Right. What you say is it's a, it, it increases the risk of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the condition, I guess, is called cannabis or marijuana induced psychosis. Um, yeah. Um, Terry, can you can you first define psychosis for those of us that are not familiar with um, that kind of terminology. Well, I mean, psychosis is a thought disorder. It's the, um, another way of looking at it, if, um, manic depression is a mood disorder. Psychosis is a thought disorder. It's, it's a disorder that affects your, your thoughts, your feelings and your emotions. And uh, the condition uh, will uh, trigger off um, high levels of euphoria. It will trigger off. Um, you get a distorted version of. You you can either see, hallucinate, or you can hear. You get paranoid, and so you can. You and so if you would you could go out, sit on a on a go in a subway and somebody walk past you, and they would look at you. Now you and I would look at them and maybe smile and carry on. But if you were psychotic and you've got this distorted um, understanding of the world, then you would look at that person and they'd say, well, they're, they're talking about me or the way they wore their hat. So you get a crazy uh, look, uh, observation of what, of what the earth is, but you get distorted. So it's really a, a thought disorder. It's, it's very, uh, you know, I consider it as one of the most disabling conditions mm -hmm. on the planet because you lose control of your ability to think for yourself. You lose the, con the ability uh, to, uh, to control your thoughts and your feelings. So it's um it it it's a it's a pretty disabilitating condition. There's no question about that. The um, so so what do you normally see in a psychosis like uh, like this? Is, is it, you mentioned paranoia several times? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you, you become like excessively conspiratorial. Um, uh, it, it, people are out to get you. I mean, how, yeah. how's that, how does that all work? It, yeah, I mean. Bearing in mind, if, if we if we have some some understanding of the way the brain works and we and the brain 
has got 86 billion cells and they're all interconnected uh, through these um, neurotransmitters. And what cannabis does, it, it interreacts with the dopamine and dopamine is a, the, the neurotransmitter is associated with the reward part of the brain and with your emotions and your feelings. And so the, so some, so the symptoms of, of, if you like, of too much dopamine, and that's what it does, you put, if you have THC, two high levels of THC, it will increase the level, artificially increase the level. So you're getting a, a, a zap of, uh, of, of euphoria. Um, so the symptoms, I mean, it can vary. I mean, you can have some good feelings. You can feel happy. You can see things. Uh, you can look at a flower and, and think how that's the beautifulest thing on this earth. So it's not all bad. I mean, you know, I mean, that most people take um, take cannabis to make themselves feel good. And it, it, it can make people feel good. But the psychosis, when it gets into the psychosis level, it can develop into um, hearing voices. It can develop into hallucinations. It can uh, you can uh, develop um, depression. Um, and um, I mean, generally, you kind of you're, you're you're getting a distorted version of it, and and the symptoms of that is you, is you would notice somebody where they they become much more recluse. They become they start living in their head, and they start um, you know just slightly strange, bizarre behaviour, speaking out a turn, laughing out, a, giggling out a turn locking themselves in the room. Um, but the main symptom of psychosis, uh, and it, again, it, it, it can vary so much. You can get a small, you can get on a spectrum, you know, you can have just have a light, a sm small degree of it. But the main symptom is, is, is voices and paranoia. Yeah. That's the main one. Yeah. You know, like I mentioned to you a little, a little bit earlier that, you know, I went researching this stuff because this condition entered my circle. And um, I initially, before I found your book, I was initially looking at scientific studies, see what was out there. And I'm going to have you talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, and then I was looking for something written by somebody who's been through it, a lay person. And that's how I found you in your book. And All right. I and I appreciate that. But um, let's go ahead and talk about the studies. And I, I read several of them especially from 2017, I think 2019, and even as recent as this year, yeah, um, that really appear to uh, really demonstrate a pretty concrete link yeah. between cannabis use and mental health issues, including psychosis. Yeah. Um, Terry, can you go ahead and talk about these studies and the evidence that's out there now? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that's worth saying is that the um, – the, the problems with cannabis has been known for centuries, uh, for a couple of thousand years. And there's, there's, there's recorded evidence um, in you know, Chinese scrolls talking about being possessed by the devil. And, and there's an interesting story of Napoleon when he invaded Egypt. Um, uh, they weren't allowed to drink um, and they got hold of cannabis because it was, it was available there. And he eventually realized that it was damaging. Um, it was, <laughs> they were refusing to fight. <laughs> they were getting, I can see that. <laughs> they were getting all spaced out. Uh -huh. so he's, he, he actually banned cannabis right back then. But the, the, the studies, the, the more, I mean, the, the, there's been a number of major studies. I mean, there's been hundreds of studies on it. But the most important one, and I think that your um, listeners need to know about, is the ones that was in the U.S., that that uh, came out, uh, the National Academy of Medicine, um, that produced um, one of the biggest pieces of work. Um, and um, I think they looked at 10,000 different pieces of work around, uh, you know, uh, extracts. And their conclusion was, and you can look it up on, on it, it's a two, 2017, uh, was, was, was it published? Um, and what they uh, what it showed there was that there was a they made a definite link between um, psychosis and marijuana. 
Um, but but it goes back to what we were saying earlier. The stronger the marijuana, and the more and the younger you take it, the risk goes up. And that that study uh, was a huge study. It's one of the biggest studies ever taken place. Mm-hmm. And that really kind of blew away all those doubters because it was a it was a major study. And then another study came out in 2019, a European study, mm-hmm. which uh, which was uh, which Professor Robin Murray um, was involved in. He's, he's one of the leading lights in the UK and when in Europe, in fact. And that uh, produced um, absolute. Uh, it was called uh, the European Research Published. Um, and what, what it was, what it did was to confirm the studies in America. And what they showed there was the link. So these recent studies are saying that the the link, it, 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 it's irrefutable now that the link is there, yeah. okay? The only way you'd prove it is to get a thousand young teenagers, make them smoke it for five years, and then you'd know whether or not it proved. Same with smoking. You know, the only way we you you they proved smoking linked it with cancer was continuing studies and linking it linking it with different things. So, these two pieces of research, the U.S. piece of research and the European piece of research, are pretty powerful uh, pieces of research, and they certainly have convinced the World Health Organization. Um, and they have, um, you know, if you look on the World Health Health, health Organization, they also refer to other studies. So um the studies are there and and it, it is in its in its and i think for me what it's all about is about giving people an informed choice so that in the same as smoking when i was uh, you know when i was a young man in my in the 60s um smoking was be- just becoming associated with cancer and heart disease and so on that basis alone, bearing in mind that something like in the 50s, 74 percent of men smoked. Um, and today it's 15 percent. And that's all about informed choice. And then so in the same way that I chose not to smoke because I didn't want to risk cancer and all that kind of stuff. Um I think what I want to do and my mission, really, what my book is all about is giving people an informed choice. You know, it's no good. It's no good. an old get like me going around saying you mustn't smoke, you know, a uh, total waste of time. But if you give people the information, then they can make a choice. And those two pieces of research, which is in my book, and I say in more detail, the one thing I will say, the important thing is they also point out the therapeutic value of it. Yeah. They also point out that the, um, that particularly the CBD part of the cannabis uh, is very, you know, uh, a multiple sclerosis. There's pretty good, and anic- not just anecdotal now. I think they've they've done some good studies now, so it does help with pain and 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 a few other things. So, yeah. so that you know, Homer, yeah, yeah, that's right, exactly. So it's but so when you talk about cannabis, you've got to be thinking about the THC. That's yeah. So, 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 so Terry, then it's, it's probably, is it fair to me to say, because in, in 2022, at least here in the United States, you know, the uh, legalization, decriminalization of recreational and medicinal uh, yeah. marijuana is gr- growing in popularity astronomically. Um, but listening to you, is it fair to say that you're not for prohibition in in a nutshell no i'm not for um, yeah. uh, prohibition um well the way i look at it is that the, the, the can, we, we now know that cannabis can cause problems particularly for young people and if we were to legalize it just straight legalize it which some countries have done Mm-hmm. then you you risk giving a message to young people that it's okay i agree we're giving them the green light and um 
and that and they are the very pe people who are most at risk so my my line on it is that i mean i used to be very pro legalizing drugs but i'm not any longer yeah. because it's not a simple question anymore it's not a question of should it or shouldn't what I'm, I'm looking and i've done the studies in the other countries and it's not straightforward the the results aren't straightforward what they've shown where the, the countries that are legal are is that young people now believe that it's safer to use yeah. okay yeah. and that young and that the the criminals are switching to young people so um so it's all again about this informed choice it's about this informed choice and for me the way forward and i've done a paper and i'm at, i've actually written to out the out the uk government have got an all party parliamentary group looking at um drug reform and i've written to the chairman of that and 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 the line i've taken is that before you even start to, you've you've got to get have a major education program so that people have an informed choice and you've also got to accept that if you do legalize it then you're going to have there's there's going to be people who are going to develop the condition of psychosis and that there's a, a and so therefore those people have got to be rescued and they've got to be treated and they've got to be dealt with they can't be treat as collateral damage uh, because the evidence I don't sort of jump any of your questions but in 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 the UK um, the latest re research would suggest that 30 percent of all new cases of psychosis are linked to marijuana uh, this is that European study yeah, yeah. Um, and Professor Robin Murray, who's, who's, I say, one of the leading scientists on this, uh, and I spoke to him about this, he said that they estimate about 10,000 people are developing uh, marijuana-induced psychosis every year, every year. So as a society, and, and that's why I mention in my book it, as a public health issue, right. we, we have to, you know, we have to accept um, that it is an issue in the same way we we recognize that smoking, smoking was a public health issue um, and we did something about it. And we've been reasonably successful in reducing the numbers, you know, and that's where we're at with 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 <clears throat> cannabis reform. And I and I, I, I mean, in a, in a way, this, I think you've got about 18 or 20 states in the UK that have, uh, have legalized it or have um, regulated have, have, in the US in the US. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, we could see them as huge experiments to see how they come out. But um, I've been yeah. looking at some of the feedback and it's not all roses. It's yeah. not, you know. Yeah, so. I, I think me and you are pretty much on the same page. I mean, I don't want to see people go to jail for it. Absolutely not. However, <laughs> After what I witnessed, uh, you know, in my circles, I, 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 can't, I can't see our youth going through that. It's just, it's horrible. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, maybe education is the key to this all. Um, yeah. This yeah. Whole problem. Yeah, I think a, a education, um, but also um, if it is if it is legalized, it has to be very carefully regulated. Um, and then also there's the, the, then the criminalization of it has got to be the crooks who genetically modify it and are throwing and, and putting poison out on the streets that young mm -hmm. kids, you know, so that has to be dealt with. It's going to take a long time. I, I, I'm an optimist and I believe we will get there. I believe in the same way optimists in the 50s thought we'd, we'd reduce the amount of people smoking tobacco. Um, in the Western world, anyway, uh, I, I think we will reduce the level. And if we can, if we can start educating people, uh, parents at the very beginning. That's why I called my book "What Every Parent Needs to Know." If we can get um, parents to um, understand this, and then over the next 10, 20 years, generation of those of, of the new generation of parents are getting across to their kids 
don't touch this stuff or, you know, we're doing it they're, they're, in my book. <laughs> there are ways you do it. You don't just tell kids. About it. But I, I, I'm optimistic that we will we will reduce the use of drugs in the next 20 years. But it's got to be a concerted effort by by governments uh, and by the public. You are optimistic, Terry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you are. I, I think one of the issues, I mean, I guess this goes together with education is just awareness because I could go out in the street of Tampa, Florida, where I am and ask people, do you know what cannabis induced psychosis is? And <laughs> nobody's going to know the answer to that. Right. Yeah. Because I, know, I mean, I'm reasonably educated in the world of healthcare and all that. And I never heard about it till like two months ago. You know? Right. Really? Well, that, 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 yeah. That's kind of scary, really, isn't it? Right. Yeah, somebody as well educated as you. Yeah. But I, but I, 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 I know that. I mean, I, when I, uh, I, I, since I've written the book, I've had some, I've had quite a few letters from people, and 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 one woman who was a teacher run back, uh, uh, wrote back to me and said exactly what you just said. She said, "I just did not know. I just did not know." But and sadly, she she got to know when her son started developing it like mine. And it's too, well, I say now it's too late, but that's, I might be being optimistic 20 years, maybe 30 years, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe 40 years. Yeah, well, we will I get mean, there. There's no doubt about it. We will get there. I think yeah, we will. Yeah. Um, Terry, let, let me ask you about the treatment for the psychosis. You know, yeah. um, are, are these... Um, and just antipsychotic drugs and um, how successful is it? Is it for a short period? Is it lifelong? Is it depend on the individual? How does that work? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, mental health is, is down to predisposition um, and genetics. Um, so to the, the degree that you get, it will vary. But if, if you develop psychosis, um, most people who develop psychosis will recover an early intervention, i.e., uh, if if it's just a, a one-off psychosis, um, or a, however, if you if you develop a um, schizophrenia, if you get a diagnosis, which is a uh, which psychosis is a part of that particular condition, it's the main part of the condition. Uh, if you develop schizophrenia, if you get a diagnosis of uh, of, of psychosis, long-term psychosis, then what will happen is you uh, medication. Uh, I don't like the idea of it, but it, it's proven to be the most uh, effective um, antipsychotics. Um, so medication is one, and but m increasingly, uh, talking therapies is proving to be very successful, uh, and um, uh, cognitive therapy is is one particular one. So talking therapies, but then of course there's other issues about uh, social intervention and getting people. Uh, engaged in the community, uh, getting them getting them into the day centres, engaging with the families is crucial, absolutely crucial. The family, I believe, the family can be the difference between recovery and relapse. Um, and you know, I, I suppose in some sense, I, I can show that with with my son Steve. We've, you know, he hasn't had a relapse, um, but we've put a lot of intensive work as lots of other parents do. Sure. So really, um, the statistic on schizophrenia, which is, um, uh, which is quite, which we, my son was diagnosed with, is that around about um, 20, 25% um, have, have a prolonged condition to the point that they are either in hospital or very incapacitated by it. Then about 30 to 40 percent of people will develop will who have psychosis, or schizophrenia, uh, will live with it. Like my son, there's no there's no there isn't a cure. He's not been cured of it, but he's learning to live with it and he's adapting to it. And he's because it's a cognitive issue as well. It affects the cognition and he's he's t teaching himself through, like talking therapy helps to do that. And then around about 20 percent, I mean, it varies enormously from country to country and mm -hmm. even city to city. So these are very generalized 
were. But about 20 percent of people who develop psychosis will completely recover um, and um, and have no providing they don't have another bash with it. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about um, sort of long term. So, I mean, you can have psychosis with if you with depression. I mean, I've known uh, people, uh, you know, people who are pregnant have had psychosis. So psychosis is is not an it's, it's not a an uncommon uh, state, uh, but it's when it's prolonged, and that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's when it's when uh, the the brain has been damaged by uh, the neurotransmitters, the, ne the the neurons have been um, damaged by it that's where you've got a problem and that's where the long-term treatment goes on. Does that make it? A, is that... No, no, no. That actually helped quite a bit. And, and some of the percentages you threw out there are, are very encouraging because yeah, I, I mean, the way I interpret it is, and there's about 25% that are really bad off and yeah. another 75% at different levels of it, doing okay to, yeah you know, full recovery. So, I mean, that's, that's very encouraging. Yeah. There, are, there are people who do recover. Yeah. And, and I, I haven't come across the research to say why that is, but it's just the way we as a species are, how we adapt, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and some people, I mean, my son, Steve, we went, we took part in a, in a, a television program where they looked at our genes. Uh, it was a, 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 a it was well, the program's called Panorama and it's an investigative program. And they wanted to see whether there was whether your genes made a difference. And so uh, th this particular scientist had worked out that there, there was they're called COMP genes, C O M P genes. Um, and that if you've got a, a particular variation of those genes, then you then you are more likely or more susceptible uh, to uh, schizophrenia or, or, or psychosis. And um, um, our genes were in, we were in the middle. Uh, we weren't at the very high end, but some people have a, a combination where they are, you know, where they are not susceptible. So they could smoke cannabis and uh, uh, and get away with it. Mm -hmm. My gene, Paul, would suggest that there's a vulnerability there. There's a slight predisposition there. Sure. And, that, and that's, um, and I'm, I'm pretty certain, had I taken it, because uh, I didn't, take cannabis somebody did give it to me at a party in a <laughs> yeah a, a, in a cake and i didn't know about it oh and 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 i, and I true honestly <laughs> scouts on that i didn't know about <laughs> it and it it sent me completely loopy absolutely loopy and this was just one one cake and i can and and um so i i know you know that, that i've you know you know, as people with addictive personalities, sure. it's, you know, we're all very complex creatures, aren't we? And one and the other important factor in all this is that we know that one in four people uh, will develop mental health that, uh, issues. That's that's the World Health Organization statistic that roughly one in four people. And that's fairly consistent throughout the world. There are some variations, but in the Western world, one in four of us will develop a mental health issue, um, which would suggest that as a species, we haven't really um, developed perfect yet. Um, we're nowhere near where sharks can kind of heal themselves and develop themselves. And they're, they're much more developed than we are in our ab their ability to, to, to sort their health issues out. We haven't. We still haven't perfected ourselves yet. So, so you can link it up if you've got a predisposition you know, one in four, if you're if you're one of the one in four and then you take uh, cannabis, then you're just pushing the risk factor up, pushing the risk factor. up. Yeah. It's a bit of Russian roulette, really. No, no, it, it really is. Um, <laughs> I can't even imagine being a, a very young person today and all the pressures and then 50 percent THC cannabis out there. And it's just uh, it's, it's too much. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Terry, now, one one thing that's become very increasingly common and popular is vaping. Yeah. Um, I, does this have a, a, a positive, negative effect on on the psychosis itself, or is there is it irrelevant? Well, the research would suggest that vaping um, isn't any better, and some research 
I think in the UK, uh, some studies have suggested in, in the US rather suggest that it could be worse mm. because um, if you you're um, you're taking it in a purer form. So you've got this little bottle and you and uh, if you've got a lot of you know high levels of THC, you're you're taking it because it, with if you're if you take a spiff of you know marijuana, then you know it's mixed up with tobacco and other things. I know they're poison as well, but you're diluting it. And I think the issue with vaping is it's undilute it can, it's undiluted. So there there the, the, there isn't any any specific research, but some of the, the initial studies are, sh- are suggesting that it isn't any better, that it isn't any safer. To, okay. Because there's also the other issues about respiratory issues and all that kind of stuff. Which, sure. Yeah. You know. um, let me ask you about, uh, well, you're, you're this man of much wisdom about this now after all these years. <laughs> um, I, I don't mean to laugh, but. Uh, no, 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 no. You, absolutely. You, you are one of the few people I know that been through this. And um, uh, what advice do you have for parents a concerning the prevention of this from the beginning. Yeah. And what what about parents and families that are already affected? And what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think two part question. First thing is, I, I kind of split this up into uh, preteens and teenage. So you deal with somebody who's preteen, obviously different to a teenager, and you can. It starts off as we all do with 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 children is basic hygiene and the, you know we teach our children you know the basic things about hygiene but we also teach our children uh, not to go into the cupboard under the stairs where there's you know there's nasty liquids under there or into you know using uh, uh, any of the into the medicine cabinet so those are they're very basic that's a basic uh, education and so if and, and then i think because kids or well, children won't understand the concept of drugs until they're around about seven, eight, nine. Again, varies on the kids. They get the concept of it. So, but the important thing is with with children, and I'm talking now to people with young children, is to talk freely about um, um, substances. Um, don't you know, dental or whatever it is, you know, and 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 so. And, and, and so that the parents, so that the children know that you talk about that. OK. And then as you get as they get older, it's important that you then. Be open and talk to them about uh, drugs. Now, in the same way is we you, you talk to them about sex, um, you know, the I mean, some people avoid avoid that conversation, but I didn't avoid that conversation so there's no reason why you shouldn't avoid that conversation with with drugs and i think the sort of thing that you can you know you can you can suggest you can uh ask say to the children you know you can say to them you know do you know i'm talking about eight year olds now 18 have you heard of drugs you know do you know about drugs get a conversation going so it's normal right you don't have to pump it into them on a regular basis but just gently talk about it. If they see something on television where there's drugs on there, say to them, "Did what, what did you think about that? Did you understand what that man was, you know, what he was taking or, or in that program? Because you, you can't avoid it, you know, if it was some, some of these things, uh, drugs. Or, or do you understand what the word drug is? So, again, all you're doing is you're getting people familiar talking about it so they feel comfortable. And then once you get into really from 11, 12, 13 onwards, that's where you can um, uh, you, you can be more explicit about it. However, you've got to be a bit more careful because as we know, and uh, I've, I've got two teenage grandchildren, um, they don't want, they know everything and we're just old farts and know nothing. So, but the way you deal with that is you uh, introduce it, if, you know, if, if they've got a sister, if they've got an arm, if they've got a gran, or you, you get somebody else to talk about it. Um, and but like with my um, grandson, I said to him, I pick him up sometimes from school if it's raining. And I openly, I say to him, I said, did, 
I said, have you heard of uh, of marijuana, cannabis? You know, of course I have. You know, this is a 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I, did, did any of the kids use it at your school? He said, yeah. I said, do you? He said, no. <laughs> I said, I said well, anyway. <laughs> the thing is, I'm having a dialogue with him. I'm having a discussion yeah. with him. And 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 I and and then you get to the point where again it's it's the, the, not just plugging my book, but I go into a lot of detail about this in my book about how you pose questions. Um, but it, when you get to the level when you've got a, a, a child, a, a young adolescent, um, and they don't want to know about it, then what you've got to do is to choose your when you. What you mustn't do is sweep it under the carpet. Mm -hmm. In the UK, this is frightening statistic, this one. I, re I read this one and it frightened me. 38% um, of 15-year-olds in the UK, according to the government's own figures, will have tried a drug. 38%. Now, most of them will be a, you know, try it or they will, you know, uh, and, and most will but. But the fact is, they are, that, that, that would suggest to you how much they are aware of it. And so I think it's in, and, and, and the, the other crucial thing that I say in my book is early intervention is absolutely paramount. So if you if you have the conversation and you feel comfortable that they're not, I didn't have this conversation with my son or, or my daughter. Uh, when they were teenagers, um, I was more thinking about, you know, making my son don't get somebody pregnant and my daughter don't get pregnant. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's what I had in my head. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 so the important thing is to get a discussion about it and you need to think about how you do it. Talk to other parents. Have you talked to, you know, say, uh, you know, you could say if you're at the school gate. Have you ever talked to your son or daughter about drugs? You know, how did you approach it? And then you get onto the situation where you suspect they might be experimenting. That's where you've really got to act. Very difficult to act, particularly if they're, they're sort of 13, 14, 15. Bear in mind, 38% of 15-year-olds would have tried something. So there's a good percent of probably about 10% of those maybe are doing it a bit more regular. So you've got to get in there. Now, the trouble is, um, this is where you need to seek help, where you need to go to the school. If, they, if they're if they not listening to you, which is a good chance they won't, then either they might listen to their sister or they might listen to their grandparents, as I previously mentioned, or go to the school, talk to the school, or they might, they might have a football coach, um, talk to the football coach. Be open about it. Don't, don't sweep it under the carpet. Because bearing in mind, we now know science has now shown us the earlier you they take cannabis, uh, marijuana, the more the, the higher the risk. Yeah. And then you get into a situation where um, you suspect not only are they taking it, it might be affecting them. And that's where it becomes, again, very difficult. And all I would say, and I've had many, many parents have contacted me not just from my book from my previous when i was working and and I, chris my wife and i we set up a self-help group for people so we used to meet a lot of people and i used to say to them don't think it's going to go away act now right you know and i'd be pretty forceful about it you know act now if you get it wrong that they are not taking it or they are not bad all you've done is you've they've they're fed up with you and you think what an idiot you are, right? But if you get it right, you might save his future. Yeah. So don't, you know, so don't worry about getting it wrong. Um, but if if you suspect, and this is uh, I've got a whole section on this, if you suspect that your uh, son, your your young uh, child or young person is 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 experiencing problems with it. You've got to go to the GP, go to your doctor. I mean, I don't know how it, how it specifically works. It's probably a similar situation in the US, but yeah. 
well, yeah, in the primary care. We, go to your GP, talk to them, go to the school, go to the college, go to seek help, go ring, ring, ring up drugs advisory groups. Um, you've got, I mean, the US, when I was researching my book, the one thing I will say, you had some of the best websites in the world. And I looked through whole loads of websites on uh, on giving advice to people. There's a there's just masses of websites out there. There's a there's a particular website, and I can't remember the name of it now, uh, of a woman who set up this website specifically about cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, her son died, unfortunately, committed suicide uh, from overdose. But uh, but the but the information uh, it, out there is fantastic. So the message really is early intervention. Don't whatever you do, don't sweep it under the carpet. Take it deadly serious. If you get it wrong, well, you're just made. You just look a bit of a twerp. If you get it right, you're going to save yourself a lot of um, uh, pain in the future. Yeah, you know, Terry. Over the past couple of years, I was me and my siblings were dealing with our mother who had dementia. And uh, I learned a lot of things, you know, I was clearly not patient enough with her and, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I, I assume as a parent dealing with a child that has cannabis uh, induced psychosis, it's um, how, how, how do you as the parent and the family as a whole um, deal with the individual that's going through that? Because it's got to be beyond yeah. stressful. Yeah. It is. I think the crucial bit is to understand what's going on. So um, read up about psychosis. Read up about, well, his, my son's diagnosis was paranoid schizophrenia. Read up about it. Find out about it. I mean, when you, you know, you buy a, a, a new computer, you don't just, you, you read up and find out how the damn thing works. And that's what you've got to do. So the first thing is read up about it. And then knowledge does give you a little bit of strength and a bit of confidence. Um, the other crucial thing is um, that you know, talk to the uh, talk to the services, talk to the professionals. Don't don't uh, and, and 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 those who shout the loudest, I'm afraid, will get heard. Yeah, um, you've got to yeah, pick, yeah, pick their brains. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pick, pick their brains. I mean, I, I I said to the psychiatrist, if I'm making a nuisance of myself, will you tell me? I said, but I probably will still continue to do that. Really? But at least I, you know, it's too important. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think knowledge is a crucial thing. Um, the other crucial thing, and the most one of the biggest things that helped us was talking to other families. Um, we we met up with other families that were going through that, and when somebody when you go to a little self help group, absolutely crucial. It was like going to the Open University for us. You go to a little, you go to a, a self help group, and then the mother says, "I know what you mean. My son does that." Mm -hmm. You think, fantastic. And then you say, "What? How did you deal with it?" Uh, well, we did this and we did that, or. Or another mother would pop up and say, well, yeah, yeah, we did this and we did that. And you think, and suddenly you get little light bulbs coming up because you can get over overawed by the whole thing. And um, mm -hmm. you don't think straight. You don't think when you're in a, you know, when your son's unwell um, and, uh, and, uh, and in a crisis, you don't think straight. Well, I didn't anyway. I, I, you can get in a bit of a panic. But I found... Going to the self-help groups was crucial. So, so knowledge, um, talking to professionals, um, finding out about the information, talking to other families is absolutely crucial. Um, patience. Well, I, I, I would, Terry, I would imagine that would be good too because I'm guessing, but I imagine when that first happened to you, you probably thought you were the only person in the world that was going through this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, absolutely. And I can say that when we met, when I met up with families, the self-help group, I would say it was probably one of the biggest factors that helped us in our own recovery, in our yeah. own well-being. And, and, and if we're feeling good about better about ourselves, then we can pass it on to Steve. Sure. And, and the same with Steve. I mean, uh, 
you know, my son Steve, he talks to people. He knows people that have got schizophrenia. He knows people that have got voices. So it kind of, he knows he's not living there alone with those yeah. voices in his head. So it, it is tough, but there's life after psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, I, I, my family have been fantastic. My, my, my brothers have been fantastic. And they, you know, my daughter said, Dad, you need to go on holiday, go on holiday. And I said, well, look, Steve's been playing up. I don't want to leave him with you and all the rest of it. We can sort it. We can sort it. And so, you know, when we started going away on holiday, it was kind of like, whew, you know, and you do, you know, and we do now we go on holiday. I mean, the, the, I mean, Steve is now 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I said to Steve the other day, I said, you know, how's your voices, Steve? He's not still there. I said, so what do you, how do you deal, deal with them? He said, you know, I tell them I bugger off, you know, or I, <laughs> You know, I I um I ignore them. He said. He said. But sometimes, when he, if I get kind of anxious, he said they get get on top of me. You know, but but you know. So he's kind of he's managing it. He's dealing with it. Um, and if you feel that he's dealing with it, we deal with it. Sure. You know, but it, it's living with a disability, whether I like it or not. I've got a son with a disability. Uh, and I'm probably, you know, we're going to have to be thinking about it for the rest of our life. And my daughter said that she would, you know, she came out with the words, that, the magic words and said, look, don't worry, Dad, when you're not here, we'll keep, you know, we'll look after him. And so that, because mm -hmm. uh, just one, <laughs> one horrible statistic is that um, uh, research has shown that carers live five years less than the average person oh yeah i, I can imagine the stress yeah, is on stress. Stress. so yeah. much yeah exactly yeah. so um yeah so i try, I try and do things to relieve the pressure but so i don't want to i want to live five years longer than most people <laughs> <laughs> but but overall you know it's 20 20 odd years later and um steve is living uh, a reasonably normal life. Is he able to like hold a job and all that or? No, no, no. Well, Steve, Steve, he's kind of damaged his, uh, his, his brain quite seriously. Mm. So um, it, it doesn't work properly. The communication systems in his brain doesn't work. Well. He's come off of the medication. He tried it and he went psychotic within three weeks. Mm -hmm. So, so we know the damage is there and it has to be dealt with so steve doesn't what but what steve is living with it uh, he doesn't like it he hates it uh but he uh, has is carving a little life out for himself what we've done and not all parents can do this but we've what we've sold we sold our house with my daughter and we bought a big house and we built a little kind of studio flat for steve and so he lives semi-independent um, because he did live independent for a while and he he be, he was on the edge of becoming alcoholic um, hmm. and he got himself in a terrible mess. Wow. So we had to sort of, we had to rescue him and bring him back in. You know, we tried to leave it as long as we could, but we couldn't leave it any longer and I wasn't mm -hmm. prepared to do that. So where we're at with Steve then is, 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 is he lives close to us uh he goes to a horticultural project three days a week he goes he's starting to go to the gym now um which is great because he i always said he you know, he was a natural athlete when he was younger he was a brilliant runner and a great footballer and he's kind of re refining himself again now and he's actually he's actually developing quite a nice physique so that's good we're still working on his socialization. He's not he's not brilliant with people because he gets paranoid still. He still gets he gets nervous with strangers. But we're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I you know, it, we've seen a, a gradual improvement over the years. So there is there is definitely life. But but Steve was badly affected by it at the beginning. So if you'd have seen him five years ago, I, I kind of thought I just I'd never I thought we'd lost him. So we've got him, we've got him back, but he's, he's not quite the, the young, he's not quite the man that I knew, but he's, he's getting there. 
well, that's something, right? That's, you know, yeah. that's something. I mean, it could be worse. and It could be worse, yeah. Yeah. It could be worse. And so I don't like, I mean, when people come to me and in, 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 they're on the early days of it, you don't, you don't paint doom and gloom because that's the last thing you want to do. Because the truth is everybody's different. And there's, and they, a lot of people with schizophrenia, with psychosis would develop. I mean, there are, there are quite a number of people with psychosis who, who work, you know, so it just so happens with Steve and, and, you know, he, 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 he doesn't work, but, but from the message really is that most people will recover and improve to a degree, mm -hmm. you know, and it yeah. will vary on the degree of that. So they will improve, and they're, as I say, there's life after it, and our life has improved substantially. You know, yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. We don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't worry uh, as much as I did do, uh, and um, I worry that I wish he could meet somebody, a partner. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask you about that, uh, Terry. Yeah. It's like, uh, how, how how is his relationships with the fairer sex? Yeah, he's not. He's he's. Um, I mean, no, he, he doesn't. He, he's told me that he's not ready for it yet. Okay. Uh, well, that's good that he, he he recognizes that. Oh yeah, yeah. I've yeah, I've yeah. spoken to him about it. He said, you know, he said, he said, who's who's going to put up with me when I? Because sometimes he he will talk to himself occasionally, um, and. Um, and he said, who's going to put up with a loon like me, you know? And I said, well, Steve, Steve, there's loads of people. You're, you're not a bad-looking bloke. Um, <laughs> and I said, you're primarily, you're fundamentally a nice man. Um, I said, a lot of people. But no, the answer is no, he hasn't. And um, I think maybe one day he will. I mean, he was, when he was, before he was, um, before he was unwell, yeah, he had a, he had a long-term girlfriend and... Yeah. You know, he was quite, you know, quite active. So, but no, I think he, 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 I think he's almost become a, what's the word? Um, what's that? Not a recluse. No, not a recluse. I think he's just accepted that sex is not, a, 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 it, it's not for him at this time in life, mm -hmm. you know? So, but anyway, so yeah, so he hasn't got a, a girlfriend. Um, one day he might. Well, it was, Terry, it was really nice to meet you here uh, long distance. Um, yeah. And uh, definitely be uh, praying and thinking about you and your family and thank you uh, the the and what you're going through. Um, let me get back to your book real quick. There we go. Yeah. Gone to pot, cannabis. What every parent needs to know by Terry Hammond. Uh, Terry, I bought this on Amazon. Uh, yep. where, where else can people find your book if they if they're interested in checking it out? Well, it's on Amazon at the moment. I've now got it in an e. It's now Amazon have put it in on ebook as well now, so you can get it um, downloaded as an ebook. Um, but if you go onto my website, uh, www.terryhammond.org.uk, um, you can get it through there uh, through my book, and you can read more about my book on my website. Um, I don't. Do you have Waterstones in your in the US? What's it called? Bookshop. Waterstones, is I, it, you, I haven't heard of it, but yeah, maybe. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, Waterstones, which is one of the, which is the biggest bookshop in the UK. Oh, okay. That they, 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 it's on, it's on. You can buy it from them. Um, but um, I haven't really focused on the US, but um, I, I'm just still plodding away in the UK. But yeah, um, but, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, for for people that are watching or listening. Uh, I'll go ahead and link to the book, the Amazon link and uh, Terry's website. So you can yeah. check it out for yourself. It's uh, yeah. it's uh, for a small book. It's very, very packed full of knowledge and information. So um, well-researched, at least in my opinion. Um, thank you very much. And I want to thank you, Terry, for sharing your story, sharing your knowledge with us on this incredibly important and I think neglected topic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. You thank bet. you, Robert. All right, I have a great day. Sir. Thank you.